What's up family, Larry here with another episode of Extended Cut. Today is a super awesome episode. We've got Wayne Somer here who preached an amazing message this past weekend. You guys are not going to want to miss this. So here you go. The summary of the sermon is really Jesus wants us to understand that the kingdom of God is everywhere mm -hmm. and it's not space-based. It is God's rule and reign and sovereignty over everyone, everything, everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and it is, it is a place where his lordship is supreme. Mm -hmm. um, and to, to get into the kingdom requires nothing more than faith. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that's, a, that's a simple statement to make, but as I said in the message, it's easy to enter, it's simple. Yes. To enter the kingdom of God. It's just not easy. Yes, very much um, so. And part of what makes it difficult was the third part of the message, which was that pride and self-righteousness mm -hmm. can be obstacles to us entering the kingdom of God. I talked about self-righteousness as sort of the close neighbor of pride. Mm -hmm. And I think you can start then start talking about things like a lack of humility. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? What does that look like? How does it manifest? Um, and, you know, we're, we're encouraged. In fact, Jesus said, whoever humbles himself will be exalted mm -hmm. and whoever exalts himself will be humbled. Mm -hmm. So if we are, we're either doing one of two things. We're either pumping ourselves up with how great we are yep. or we're telling God, you know, I'm, I'm, not, a, I'm not all you want me to be yet. Mm -hmm. And so do what you need to do to make me who you want me to be. Mm -hmm. And part of that, and this is what Jesus, I think, really demonstrates, part of that is being willing to serve and being willing to be served. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, uh, we talked about a little bit ago about the whole, the grabbing the tab at a meal. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a guy, um, still a close friend of mine, that we used to meet regularly, mm -hmm. Saturday mornings, mm -hmm. for coffee or breakfast or something. And there were some mornings that he would just he would just pay the check, and I'd be like, "Oh man, you don't have to do that." And he goes, "You trying to rob me of my blessing?" Mm. Mm. And I was like, "No." <laughs> 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 but I think at the heart of a feeling like that is, you know, are you telling me I can't afford to pay for this, yep. or that you know that you're better than me? Mm -hmm. And and it's not that he he did it out of love. He just, he wanted to bless me because by blessing me, he felt great himself. It was a joy for him to do that. Yeah. Um, and I miss those coffees with him. Yeah. No, really, <laughs> miss I miss those. I get that. Um, I get that. And, go ahead. And, and I think that's interesting that you say that as well, too, because so often, like we've talked about before, what we could think of ourselves as being humble or what is mm -hmm. actually humility is actually our pride manifesting. Mm hmm and I think it's really interesting, the other relationship and, you know, talking about pride and you, you mentioned shame as mm -hmm. well, too, during the message, how pride can oftentimes be our source of shame. Mm -hmm. You know, somebody's picking up a tab. Oh, you don't think I can do this or mm -hmm. X, Y, and Z? Maybe it's because, you know, maybe we are on, on hard times mm -hmm. or maybe there is something, mm -hmm. something that's, you know, not quite what we would consider up to snuff right. in that moment. And it, it, it just... It's, it's interesting how what we think is the opposite of shame is actually its source sometimes. Yeah. So with the humility side, how, you know, new believer, somebody that's walking with Jesus for, for quite some time, um, how would you say we are called to experience God's humility? And it's not, it's not easy, mm -hmm. the humility of God. Mm -hmm. um, what are some practical steps that you think we could take to to really find ourselves in a place where we're humble before the Lord? Um, I would say probably one of the first places to start is being thankful. Mm. Gratitude. Um, I remember one day um, I was leading a small group uh, not far from here, and I was driving from Aurora mm. to this small group that night. And it had been a really rough day. And I got in the car, and I knew I was not in a frame of mind to go in and lead a small group. And I said, you know what? I am just going to start listing everything I am thankful for 
and telling God about it. Mm -hmm. And for 50 minutes, that's what I did. Wow. And the interesting thing was, I wasn't even done by the time I got there. Wow. Um, and by the time I got there, I had joy in my heart mm -hmm. because my gratitude was me saying, God, you've given me things I couldn't get on my own. Yeah. And if I can't be humble about those and thankful for those, then I'm going to be in a world of hurt because when there comes a time when I can't provide something or acquire something that I need, I'm going to put it on myself to try to do that. And if I fail, that's just going to increase my sense of shame mm -hmm. because it wounds my pride. Yeah. Uh, when, when, I'm, when the exact opposite is to say, God, I, I can't do this. I don't have this. I mean, one of the most humbling experiences that I ever went through was four months after I became a Christian, I lost my job. Mm. I was unemployed for eight months with two little baby girls mm. and thinking, how am I going to, how am I going to provide for them? In fact, Bishop Fuller was my pastor at the time and I actually went to him and I said, you know, Brett, what if it's God's will for me to be homeless, you know, for his glory? I mean, that was terrifying to me to yeah. think of my kids you know and me out on the streets mm -hmm. and he said won't happen he said you're in a church that loves you mm -hmm. you'll come live with us wow and that was humbling and so wonderful on so many levels yeah um and uh that whole eight month period i refer to that as probably the most impactful eight month period of my life because I had to totally rely on God for everything, mm -hmm. for any temporary work that I got. Yeah. Um, and whereas, you know, in the first two weeks, I'm downstairs pounding my prayer bench and saying, how come you haven't given me a job yet? And yeah. just, you know, crying out to him. To at the very end, having a former colleague of mine who gave me some temp work that was very basic temp work and he was apologizing hand over fist because it was just so basic and rudimentary. Yeah. And I was just so thankful wow. to have it. I told him, I said, I don't care. Yeah. You know, I'll just, I'll give you the best I got. Mm. And that was humbling. It was accepting God's provision and accepting provision from another human being who at one point had worked for me. Wow. Um, but... God brought me to the point where he's like, I'm like, okay, I can deal with that. Wow. I'm okay with it. Yeah. Because those people, um, I, I have probably about, I don't know, five or so folks who they know they can say whatever they need to say to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and when they say it, I don't sit there and think, oh, you know, what nerve does this person have telling me? It's I'm listening and going, I need to pay attention. <laughs> when so-and-so says something, I need to pay attention. Yeah. Um, and they feel the freedom to do that, and they've given me the, the ability to do that in return. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it takes a lot. And if you're married and your wife doesn't have the authority to do that, yeah. oh, you're really missing it then. <laughs> yeah, no. I mean, I can, I can just imagine that. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, let me think about it. This is a person that you spend more time with than anybody else on the planet. Um, and, you know, when the scripture tells us the two are to become one flesh, it's not just talking physically, it's talking about a uniting of spirit, of uh, our mentalities, to the point where, you know, you see those jokes of older couples, they say they start to look alike as they get older and yeah. they've been married longer. Um, I think that's part of the fact that they become to seem so similar because they're meshing well. Wow. They're becoming one person. Uh, not one person physically, but one entity in terms of their mindset. Um, and if that person can't speak into your life, mm -hmm. then that's just a huge void that's being missed because uh, that person loves you <laughs> yeah. and they want the highest and best for you. So if you can't listen to them, that's a real issue mm -hmm. and it's not their fault. <laughs> you got to look in the mirror on that one. That's real. Well, uh, I've learned that lesson the hard way. Um, you know, gr my family uh, growing up, I love my family. I love my parents. They did wonderful things for me. But they had their own set of baggage that they brought in. Uh, and 
part of it was shame-based uh, mm -hmm. because of that types of households that they grew up in. Yeah. Another part was envy-based. Mm -hmm. um, and so I learned at a very young age uh, to be judgmental, to be prideful. Mm. Um, and you know, frankly, uh, I had a, a lot of reasons to be proud, not in a good sense. Yeah. I mean, I did well in school, you know, I was school leader in various capacities. And so I began to think pretty good about myself yeah. um, and got good at it. <laughs> yeah, that's real. Uh, and, you know, it wasn't until I became a husband and started living with someone who was from the get-go very genuine mm -hmm. um, and very open and wanted that oneness to be real. Mm -hmm. um, you know, part of when you're when you're prideful, you're able to throw up those walls yeah. uh, mm -hmm. and put the masks on. Mm -hmm. You know, this is who I am, right? You know, no, not really. Yeah. Um, but Susan saw through all that and. She didn't hesitate to speak lovingly uh, into those habits. Uh, and a combination of being married to her and her being a wonderful wife in that capacity, and then coming to know Jesus and having the Holy Spirit join the chorus, yeah. um, and then having two daughters, uh, two daughters will humble you. That'll do it. Yeah. They will humble you. I love my daughters. They are so precious to me. But they, they're not guys. No, no. <laughs> and sure. they can't be treated that way. That's only real. Uh, and so you really do have to look at yourself and ask yourself, what image am I projecting to them? Am I being a loving father or am I supposed to be some, or am I trying to be some stereotype, mm -hmm. you know, of a super dad? An archetype. You're yeah. Just like, oh, if I'm just like this, then everything will be okay. Exactly. Vers versus being genuine in who yeah. Christ has created you to be. Yeah. And, and they've, you know, they've seen me real. They know me. They, they, they've seen me be not great at times, you know, mm -hmm. angry or, or whatever, or selfish. Um, yeah, but they know that Toward them, it's a heart of love that comes most of the time from me and not one of selfishness and pride. Yeah. Uh, and I, I value their input. Um, I have very different relationships with each one of them, but very open relationships where we can talk, you know, adult to adult. Yeah. Um, and that's, that's very helpful in me being able to see the reflection of myself, the true reflection, in the way they relate to me. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that, if that makes sense no, or not, does, yeah. but, you know, I, I don't see them being phonies with me. They're very honest back to me, and they don't have a problem calling me out. <laughs> <laughs> they don't. Uh, they do it lovingly and they do it respectfully, but they have no problem calling me out and forcing me sometimes to justify a particular position or opinion I might have. Mm -hmm. um, and that's also humbling yeah. <laughs> because you've got to think, do I really believe what just came out of my mouth? Mm -hmm. Or am I trying to portray some sort of image Mm -hmm. uh, instead of being honest. And I think that's part of humility is your willingness to be honest all the time, yeah. uh, whether it's with someone else or with yourself. Mm -hmm. um, and in the most humbling of all is when you're sitting in prayer and you're talking to God about something and in the middle of the sentence you realize, I'm just BSing him right now. <laughs> and then, and then, you real. Real. then you then you realize, he knows. <laughs> yep. I can't fool him. What yep. am I even trying? Yeah. And so you kind of step back a minute and you say, "Sorry, Lord. Let me let me start again." Mm -hmm. um, and then be honest, because I think He wants us to feel free to be honest with Him, because He knows it all anyway. Exactly. When He talks to us or asks us questions, He's not looking for information. Mm -hmm. He's looking for what's the condition of your heart. Mm -hmm. You know, where are you in relation to me and um, where do we need to work? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I love that you say that because even in Genesis where he looks for Adam and Eve and he says, where are you? Yep. Like I always tell people that's like playing hide and seek and 
you know, putting a lampshade on your head and hiding in a corner and thinking that you're, and I think that's something that we've all been guilty of. Maybe as yes. kids hiding from a parent or something like that. It's like, Oh, mm -hmm. where are you? It's like, I'm looking at you. <laughs> like, well, it's, like, <laughs> it's when they're toddlers and they put their hands over their eyes yep. and you can't see me, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, but you know, that's, that's when it really gets real when you're, when you're sitting before the Lord and you realize he already knows it all anyway. Mm -hmm. So, just be honest, yeah. you know, because no one loves us more than he does. Mm -hmm. No one can love us more than he does. And the fact that he loves us and he wants the best for us, I think that's what's so hard to grasp sometimes in our relationship with the Lord. Um, and I don't, I don't know if I had, I had so much in my initial outline for yeah. this sermon. And then as I ran it past other people and they're saying, you know, there's too much there. You, yeah. need, to, you need to pull back. Yeah. Um, and when I timed it and I was like, oh my goodness, this is way too long. <laughs> I had to cut this back. Yeah. Um, but, you know, part of it is understanding that, that God's not a cosmic killjoy. Mm. Uh, he's not there to make us feel bad about ourselves or to take away our joy. And in fact, in, in this one part I, I had originally considered was, you know, we look at the words commandment, mm -hmm. law, statute, and we think of them in our, you know, our own domestic political terms. You know, a law is something that by golly you obey it or there's a penalty, yeah. you know. But I think with God, there's a degree of that but for the most part, those are guardrails. Yes. He's, so he's saying, he, he's got this huge field called life and there are, there's a fence around it. Yeah. But if all we do is go stand next to the fence and complain of how trapped we feel. We miss out on what he's already We're given. missing out yeah. on all the other stuff that he wants us to enjoy. Oh. Um, and those, those guardrails aren't meant to rob us of joy. They're meant to make sure we can enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Enjoy the joy, if you will. Yeah. Uh, because they say, you know, if you go over here, you're going into some place you really don't want to be. Yeah. It's not good for you. It's not healthy. Um, you're exposing yourself to an unnecessary risk. Mm -hmm. And it's not to say that he can't deliver us some risks, but the scripture also says you don't put the Lord your God to the test. Yep. Uh, that's why I don't walk blindfold across 285 or 470. You know, you just, <laughs> I love it. Yeah. You know, it's just not what you do. Yeah, let's not say we didn't. But those guardrails, um, those guardrails are there. And as we consider them in terms of how we live our lives, you know, the Pharisees, their problem was they saw the guardrails and they said, you know, that is it, that's a third rail. Mm -hmm. You don't want to touch that rail yeah. because you'll get electrocuted if you touch it. Mm -hmm. And that's never what God intended, um, you know, and it's, I think, what Jesus was trying to show them uh, with uh, the parables that he told and, and also when he healed the man with dropsy. Uh, he basically wanted you to know, you know, this is, this is what God really cares about. Yeah. You know, he, he doesn't care that on the Sabbath day you can't walk within six meters or it's called you know any farther than that and it's work yeah you know mm -hmm. it, that's not what he cares about that's not what he intended for that mm -hmm. when he said on the sabbath day you'll rest and he says so your servants can rest too yeah. because he reminds us he says you all came out of slavery mm -hmm. i delivered you and now i want you to rest so it really was an opportunity to rest the body to rest the mind to engage the spirit yeah. um, and to, you know, enjoy that period of downtime. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think it's sad that as a culture, especially a Western culture, we've lost that concept. I, one of the saddest things to me, and I remember these laws because I was a kid at that time, was what they used to call blue laws, mm -hmm. which was unless you were a drugstore or a grocery store, you weren't open on Sunday. Wow. You were closed. Wow. All stores closed. In fact, my mother, when I was a little kid, my mother worked at a department store that closed down early on Saturday. Mm. Closed down at like five o'clock wow. on Saturday. That'd be unheard of now. Oh yeah. I mean, you like, just you're wouldn't not do open that. until midnight. What exactly. In the world? You know. No way. Or twenty-four-seven. Come yeah. on, I need to shop. Um, but that was a time when, and even, and it was a time even if you weren't a churchgoer or a believer. It was a time to rest, yeah. you know. Uh, 
word tells us that God sends the rain on the unrighteous as well as the righteous. Well, he puts rest out there for the unrighteous as well as the righteous. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so that we remember him. Yeah. Uh, so. You know, one of the things that you said during the message, you know, I loved the comparison that you gave between a walk with Jesus and, you know, other, other religions or other faiths. You know, you said that other religions are going to give you suggestions on what you should do. But when we come to Jesus, you're receiving news on what's already been done. Mm -hmm. You know, would you care to elaborate on that a little bit? Because I just thought that that was an amazing, amazing description of what Jesus has done for us and how he moves on our path already before we even really come to him. Sure. I, I have to give the credit for that particular quote that I shared to, to Tim Keller. Um, I think that was probably one of the items that he repeats frequently mm -hmm. or repeated frequently in his messages. Um, but I know it was a concept I wrestled with when I first became a Christian. Uh, the whole concept of grace. Um, you know, I, re I remembered listening to Ravi Zacharias once. I don't know if you're familiar. Oh, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and he talked about ministering to some uh, Muslim men once. And the concept of forgiveness was foreign to them. Um, and he said, you know, that that's at the core of what Jesus did mm -hmm. was paid that debt so we could be forgiven. Mm -hmm. Everyone else is saying, you know, here's the 10 things you need to do. Here's the five prayers you need to pray yeah. every day at these particular times. Uh, here's the laws you need to follow. Jesus said, you know, I already did it all. I fulfilled the law on your behalf. I died the death you should have died in your place because I loved you. Yeah. And so now here it is for free. Just come get it. Right. And all I have to give up is my independence because I have to be able to say, all right, you have not just my faith, you have me. You know, this is all I've got, warts and all, yeah. to give you. Um, and that's the good news. And that's what's hard for people to accept, I think, because when you start talking about Jesus, you know, everybody gets like, mm, <laughs> oh, stiff, like, oh, you know. Yeah. <laughs> um, I love that. And I remember early on in my walk, I had um, someone I worked for who said to me, well, in our family, we just teach that Jesus was a moral teacher. And I didn't didn't know better at the time, but over the years of walking, like, no, yeah, you know, he, yes, he did teach morality, but so much more. It was so much more. He taught, and this is one of the things I, I love in the scriptures when the people say, "But Jesus, his teachings aren't like the Pharisees. He teaches with authority." Yes, yes. And you think about who they're talking about. They're talking about the religious leaders of their time, yep. who were the experts yep. in the law and they don't teach with authority mm. jesus comes preaching compassion love turn now and accept the kingdom of god yeah. and they're saying that's authority yeah and it really is mm -hmm. because it's the truth mm -hmm. <laughs> it is the absolute truth uh we i think and i'm using a royal we hear people want to shy away from the truth because the truth will tell you who you are yes um, Very much so. You know, the truth doesn't lie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's not profound. That's yeah. just the truth. The truth doesn't lie. And, and in those moments where you find yourself doing something in a fit of anger or saying something that you should have said, you know, I love the line that we always like to say or so, tell ourselves, it's like, oh, well, that's not really me. Right. That's yeah. not really who I am. <laughs> you know, that was just a moment. That's that's yeah. not really who I am. But like you're saying, the truth will tell us. Yeah. Nope. That's kind of who you are. You find out what's in your cup when it gets tipped. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, but you know that was that's the beauty I think of Jesus and what it took me almost 30 years to really be able to embrace his grace fully mm -hmm. and I'm I'm I wouldn't say I'm 100% there yet I, I still find times when I'm thinking oh I should know better I shouldn't have done that I shouldn't have done this um, or I did it, and I'm like, mm, I don't really want to talk to God about that right now. Yeah. <laughs> it's not a good time. <laughs> but it's in those times where he's saying, look, I already know. Come talk to me about it. Get it off your back. 
You know, Jesus said, cast your cares on me because I care for you. He doesn't want us carrying this stuff. And that's also part of the good news. He's like, all these burdens that you're carrying, you know, take my yoke upon you and learn from me because my yoke is easy, my yep. burden is light. You know, I talked about a yoke of oxen uh, mm -hmm. in, in the message and how when you're yoked to Jesus, He's doing all the work. <laughs> You're just walking to keep up. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I love, and I love that that passage. That his yoke is light. Mm -hmm. It is easy. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a free gift. He's he's bringing us into something that that we couldn't even really begin to fathom. Mm -hmm. um, but I know you mentioned our own pride as one of the things that keeps us keeps us bound to it. Yeah. Keeps us bound to not accepting that gift and not taking that that easy burden and instead trying to do it ourselves and keep that burden on ourselves. So. Well, and, and you like that metaphor of the yoke. I mean, if you've ever seen a yoke. Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. You know, talking about putting either a two by six or a four by six on your shoulders. I'm okay. <laughs> I'm good. I'll pass. That's, that's I'll pass on that one. pretty uncomfortable. Yeah, you know, I'll, pass, I'll totally pass on that Jesus one. Jesus says that's not my yoke. It's like it's made out of balsa wood or something. Yeah. Because he's carrying it. He's doing the work. Wow. And that's, that's good to know I don't have to do the work mm -hmm. all the time. Um, it doesn't mean I don't have to do things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I have to do a job. And even, even now that I'm in retirement, um, there are acts of service that mm -hmm. I want to do. Uh, and so I need to be faithful about them. Mm -hmm. There's time in the Word that's important. It's not because, you know, there's no commandment that says, Thou shalt spend an hour in the Bible every morning. Yeah. You know, it's not there. Mm -hmm. I'm there because I want to be. That's good. Um, I, I, I've told some people this, and maybe I even told you, I'm, I'm doing a study with a friend of mine uh, back east. Yeah. And we are going through every book of the Bible. And we started, we started together, I think it was in Numbers. And That's a book to start with. <laughs> we just finished Chronicles this morning. Oh, wow. And we're getting ready to go into Ezra. I mean, we're just going to plow through it as, it as long as we can. We do a couple chapters a week. And we, we write down uh, our res results of this study. And it's basically, what am I observing, observing in these chapters? What does this teach me about God? How can I apply it to my life? Yeah. And it is amazing to me, one, the depths of God that are still there to be plumbed. Mm -hmm. I mean, when He is an infinite God... It's hard to, to try to capture all of him. Yeah. But the other part, though, is there's this constant theme that runs through all of it. Mm -hmm. You know, all the bad kings of Israel and Judah, yeah. you know, all the time in the desert and Moses getting frustrated and leading them out of captivity. The whole theme is God loves us. Mm -hmm. And he is leading us to the place where we ultimately will be in the kingdom with him. Um, and that entry is voluntary. That's amazing. Yeah. I guess, just looking backwards, for me, the greatest obstacle that I overcame in moving from an unbeliever to a believer was people are going to make fun of me. Mm. And, and wow. This, this is not a joke. I, it, we, several weeks before I actually came to Christ, I was sitting in the office of a woman who worked for me, and these were my words. I'm saying, you know, this whole Jesus stuff, this is just a crutch people use. Mm. They set up this standard that's so high that they can't live up to it, and so consequently they have an excuse for not living up to it. Mm. And, and that's, you know, that was me preaching at the time out of ignorance. Yeah. Um, but that day that Mark, Pastor Mark preached that John 640 in the very end of the service he says you know um, who's gonna who wants to change their life today mm. and I thought I'll raise my hand that's it I'm gonna do nothing else yeah and so he he prays for everyone and then he said you know I think there's some people want to make their profession public today we're gonna open up these front rows here so that during the music you can come forward that's amazing and I remember I'm thinking no way there's no way I'm walking forward and it wasn't three chords into the song and I'm 
boom. It's just like there was no holding me back. <laughs> I love it. Uh, and I, I believe that was a supernatural gift of God saying, you need to start walking. Mm. You need to get up here. Mm -hmm. um, I could have stopped. I could have turned around. But I was probably most concerned about, well, people are going to think I'm weird now. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm one of those Bible thumpers kind yeah. of people. But once I came to Christ, it didn't matter anymore. It's, wow. it's, like, it's like that whole thing just went away. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, if there's a fear that people are going to think you're weird because you believe in that Jesus stuff, that's somebody else's defense mechanism. Mm. Because, wow. you know, I think, I think there's a conviction of the Spirit that falls on all of us to various degrees. Yeah. And we can either accept it or not. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a poem called The Hounds of Heaven, yeah. and, and it's basically an allegory of how God chases after us. Wow. He won't compel us, but he puts up a pretty good case. Very good case. For someone to say, yeah, I've seen all that, but no, I don't want it. Mm. Uh, he's like, okay, <laughs> change your you, mind. You I'm say here. so, bud. It's like, all you right. Know, just make sure you do it before yeah. your days are over. And if you know when those days are, then mm -hmm. all power to you, buddy. Yeah. Um, but it's getting over that feeling like someone else is going to make fun of you. They might. Yeah. But you're not going to care yeah. at that point. It's like, okay, make fun of me. Go ahead oh. and bring it on. Um, I remember I told someone shortly after I had gotten saved, I told them what would happen to me. And they went, oh, well, it's not the be all and the end all. And I said, well, as a matter of fact, it kind of is. Yeah. And they're like, like well, well, something else, you know, just, <laughs> but, um, you know, that, that's an obstacle I think some people are afraid of. They don't want to be seen as being stupid or the whole concept of needing a savior is so, uh, and this is something Keller likes to say, it's so archaic, mm. you know, I'm, I'm, I don't need a savior. I'm, I can do these things myself. Mm -hmm. Well, guess what? You can't. Mm. Um, and, you know, every, every good evangelist I've ever listened to has always said, don't judge it until you've explored it. Mm. Um, you know, when people look at me and they say, you know, well, you know, the God of the Old Testament, he was, he was so violent and just wiping out people. Even when you look at those incidents. The grace, mercy. He justice, was being love, merciful peace. and loving. He was <laughs> like, saying, those are my kids. Yeah. And you're going to get your hands off of them or you're going to deal with me. Mm. And, you know, he knew their hearts. Um, he knew the other nations. And he also said, you know, if you in these surrounding nations to Israel who are about to suffer my discipline, if you want to turn to me, come on, I'll, yeah. I'll take you in. Yeah. You can be part of this nation. Mm -hmm. And so God, God always has his heart open to people. And so I got off the track of it. I thought I was pursuing there. Um, no, no, you're good. It's, it, um, and I, I do love that you mentioned that as well, too, because you know, that's similar to Pastor David's oh, sermon last week. Yes. You know, fool around and find out. He was warning them. He's like, hey, guys, listen, come to me, please come to me. Those yes. are my kids. Come to me, come to me. And they yeah. said no. Yeah. And, and, and it's interesting. This morning I said we finished uh, the last chapter of Chronicles. And the last chapter of Chronicles is the last acts of the final four kings of Judah before God carted them off mm -hmm. into exile in Babylonia for 70 years. Yeah. And even though God told, um, I think it was Josiah, he said, you know, I love all the things you're doing here, but my decision is done. Judah needs to be disciplined. Yeah. But because I love you, I'm going to take you out so you don't have to live through what's about to go down. Because wow. um, essentially he's saying, you know, Judah's going down hard. Yeah. And I'm yeah. not going to make you go through this. Feel this one, yeah. And so at that point, you're like chapter 34 or whatever, and you're, you're reading and you're going, okay, you know, this is done deal. This is going to happen. And then you get to chapter 36, the last one, and you see where God's still sending them prophets saying, you know, come on, just turn around, stop your wickedness and come back to wow. me. Um, and they said, you know, and he said, okay, you know, 
I'm not going to crush you, but 70 years, you're going to go into exile. Yeah. And it was for discipline. And at the end of that 70 years, he was just waiting. Come on back. Let's mm. start again. Yeah. I'm here. Let's do this. Um, and I, I think for people who are unbelievers, that concept is very hard to swallow. Mm -hmm. You know, because they're seeing this God of the Bible who was rules and order and discipline and all that. But it's all out of love. Yeah. Uh, I guess, I think it's in Hebrews where mm -hmm. it says that he disciplines us as a father disciplines his son. Yeah. You discipline your sons and daughters because you love them. Not, not because you want to be them. mean to them. Exactly. Um, and I, th I think that's a concept that's hard for people as well, too. It is. And, and, and I think that's an obstacle as an unbeliever that some people run into. But it's because they've only heard from someone who knew someone who talked about Jesus. Yeah. They never sat down and said, let me just find out who this Jesus is. Yeah. Who does he say he is? Mm -hmm. And how does he back it up? Now, that's at the very end, that fact that I put up there, the mathematics yeah. of even just fulfilling eight of the properties, being prophecies being one in 100 quadrillion. Yeah. I mean, that, for, for, for some of us as nerdy types, you know, that, that's a cool thing. It that's, is. Yeah, you know, no, okay, there, is. there's some evidence right there. But when you begin to look at the rest of the evidence about Jesus, the things that he did, and looking at the extra biblical evidence mm -hmm. that even talks about he was a real person, yeah, um, and that you know he really did appear to five hundred people before he went back up to heaven, yeah. you know, some oh, it's just it was mass psychosis. Well, no, you know, five hundred people don't have the same vision yeah, at the same exactly, time. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, there's there's so much evidence there that before you judge it, go read it. Mm. You know, and if you're going to judge it, judge it out of knowledge, not ignorance. Mm. Because, you know, ignorance just leads to our own downfall. Wow. So good. Ed? Well, and I would say just for someone who is actually a believer walking now, uh, whether you're, you know, new, been a couple years, long time, um, is really understand God's grace. Mm. You know, his, his grace is sufficient for everything. Wow. And what I love about some of those times, you see words like everything in the Bible mm -hmm. or never. There's no asterisk there. Mm -hmm. There's no fine print that says, uh, with the exception of these five things. I mean, yeah. God tells you straight out, yeah. this is how I feel. Yeah. This is what I think. And so we don't have to guess. And that's the beauty of grace is he tells you, I've forgiven you. Mm -hmm. I love you. Um, you know, if you've done something that's not pleasing, just repent. Yeah. Go the other way. Change your behavior. And we're cool. I love that. You know, uh, but that also takes some humility. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> just a little bit, yeah. Wow. So I guess if I had a, a final word from that message, it's, it's probably this one little point that I hit in there where I said Jesus didn't expose the Pharisees because he wanted to humiliate them. He exposed them and he reproved them because he wanted them to see and repent. Oh. He wanted them to change their ways. And I think that's God's message to all of us. So good. You know, if we're seeing things in our life, difficult circumstances perhaps, or struggles in our, in our walk with Christ that, you know, we're running into obstacles and feeling like I just don't have it. Well, understand that feeling may be he's trying to get you to understand that his grace is sufficient mm. so you need to take some time and start exploring those and uh, as i said to you at the outset if you're a man or a woman and you don't have at least one other man or woman walking with you that you've given authority to speak into your life you need to go out and find them that's good uh, I, I know one preacher said every believer needs to have uh, a Paul, a Barnabas, and a Timothy. Yep. Someone who's sowing into you, a peer that you can relate to, and then someone that you're sowing into. into. Mm -hmm. uh, all of those things will change your life as a believer. Wow. They really will. And so they'll good. keep you from, from being the Lone Ranger Christian. 
Right. You know, <laughs> I love just, that the Lone Ranger. Because yeah. it doesn't work. <laughs> it does not work yeah. at all. And it's it's sort of an oxymoron. You know, I can't be a loner and be a believer. It really we is. were created for community, mm -hmm. uh, and created to walk out this kingdom in community. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, find you know, Mansfield calls it your band of brothers. Mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe it's your sisterhood. Whatever you want to call it, find those people, and make it a point to meet with them regularly and give them the freedom to look at you and say, brother, sister, here's what I'm seeing. Mm. And they may be even complimenting you. Yeah. You know, I'm seeing God's grace coming out of you and I'm seeing, this is just beautiful. I'm seeing mm. how you're walking in your gifts. That's great. But when they do say to you, you know what? I heard you the way you responded to so-and-so. There's a little heavy duty there. You know, what's going on? Yeah. That is because they want you to be right. That's good. So good. So good, Wayne. Thank you. Thank you, It's sir. my pleasure. It was really a joy. Appreciate it. Really appreciate this. Family, thank you so much for joining us today. We hope it was nourishing to your soul, and we'll see you in the next episode.